This is Miss Fabiola Tubman. She was supposed to spend the night partying with her girlfriends, but you see, she hadn't worn high heels in a long time. And you know where the danger is. The thing goes... Long story short, she finds herself in the EC with a fracture, and now she presents to you the author student. So today we are going to help you to learn how to help manage people like Miss Fibiola. We are going to define what a fracture is, outline the classification, and then give an approach to the management of fractures. A fracture is an incomplete or complete break in the continuity of a bone. A fracture can be open or closed. An open fracture is when there is a break in the continuity of the skin along with the continuity of the bone, causing the fracture to communicate with the environment outside of the body. A closed fracture is when there is no break in the continuity of the skin. Fractures can be complete, meaning the bone is separated into two or more pieces, or they can be incomplete, meaning the break does not separate the entirety of the bone. So why is managing fractures so important? Can we not just let the body figure things out as it does with many other issues? Well, a fracture can cause life-threatening or life-altering complications such as compartment syndrome, hemorrhage, nerve injury, infection, thromboembolism, and shock. We need to save the life, save the limb, and then ultimately manage the fracture. To save life, we apply the advanced trauma life support principles. Once the patient is stable, we need to assess the injured limb or site of the fracture. We must do a motor and sensory examination in the area surrounding the fracture to check the extent of nerve injury. We must assess the vascular function in the area by palpating the pulses. Remember that shocked patients will have decreased systemic pulses, so you need to always check if the pulses are equal on both sides. Angiography or Doppler can be used to further assess perfusion if necessary. Assess the risk of any short-term complications like compartment syndrome, rhabdomyolysis and crush injury and manage accordingly. If the fracture is open, remember to document the wound by taking extensive notes describing the size, the visible contents, the extent of bleeding and the presence of any contaminants. Or you can simply take a picture. Open fractures also need to be cleaned with saline and wrapped with a wet saline dressing while awaiting surgery. At this point, the patient can be sent to x-ray. Once we have saved the limb, we may now focus on the fracture. There are four basic steps that outline the philosophy of managing fractures. Step number one is analgesia and splinting. You must ensure that you give your patient appropriate analgesia. This can be done intravenously or orally, depending on your patient's level of consciousness. Next, you must splint the fracture until there can be a decision made on definitive management. This is done to minimize movement and prevent further injury. The next step is to assess the displacement so we can decide on the definitive management. This is done using imaging and the abbreviation LARA to denote length, a position, rotation, and angulation. A fracture will be deemed acceptable or unacceptable depending on the values of each modality as seen in the table below. An acceptable displacement will not require reduction while an unacceptable displacement will require reduction. There are two methods of reduction, closed which is non-surgical and open which means that you will need surgery for reduction. Most fractures will be managed conservatively with a closed reduction, while some more complicated fractures will require an open reduction. Closed reduction is indicated for all displaced fractures, even those which are being prepared for internal surgical fixation. The indication for open reduction surgery includes failed non-operative management, unstable open fractures, displaced intraarticular fractures, and multiple fractures which involve the pelvis, the femur, or the spine. This takes us to step number four, which is immobilization. We immobilize the fracture to maintain reduction and promote corrective healing. 
This is done in the form of external or internal fixation. And both of these are done in surgery. After internal fixation, there can be further external immobilization to keep the area stable for optimal healing. This includes traction or bracing, a back slab or a circular cast with the also famous plaster of Paris, known to the public as cement. It is important to remember that we must immobilize the joint below and the joint above a fracture for optimal healing. Patients need to be advised to seek medical attention should any signs of complications of casts and splints develop. These include pressure sores, DVTs, and compartment syndrome. Patients also need appropriate physiotherapy to prevent contractures and joint stiffness and to return the function of the limb to as close to normal as possible. So, in summary, in any patient with a fracture, it is important to prioritize the life first. We then assess and manage problems specific to the limb and then address the fracture itself last. The management of fractures can be surgical or non-surgical, depending on the stability and displacement, extent of injury, and associated prognosis.